This morning, I'm happy to introduce Dr. John Pullman. Dr. Pullman is originally from Columbus, Ohio and completed his undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University, um, where he was inducted into the Tau Beta Pi Engineering Honor Society. He then attended medical school at St. Louis University in Missouri, where he graduated with distinction in medical education before joining us here at UW. He uh, now is one of our current fourth year uh, OBGYN residents and has served as administrative chief resident this year. Um, he has been involved in numerous research projects with MFM while a resident, um, and after graduation, he will be starting his fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at Women and Infants Hospital uh, Brown University in Rhode Island. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pullman this morning. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Bazzuto. For those listening that I have not met in person, I'm John Pullman, and I'm one of the fourth year residents here in OBGYN at UW Madison. And I'm very excited to present my topic today for Grand Rounds Stress Response and Coping in the Field of OBGYN. There's our text slide if we need that again. I have no disclosures. The main disclaimer that I have is that language used in many studies pertaining to OBGYN refer solely to women or mothers. Where possible, language that attempts to encompass the broader group of individuals who can give birth or experience gynecologic disorders is used. Our learning objectives today are listed here. To start, I think that I can say with confidence that every single person listening today has experienced stress at some point in their lives. I'd go on to say that many of us have experienced stress in the past month, still many even in the past week. Speaking only for myself, I can say that I've even experienced stress today. Stress is an experience that is truly universal, whether that is fleeing for your life from a predator, adapting to a change in temperature, fighting off an illness, or reading the news. Stress evokes a complex physiologic and psychologic response. We experience stressors and then respond to them with the goal of survival and adaptation. The stressors that we experience acutely and chronically can impact our health and well being long term. Because every one of us has a unique set of experiences throughout our lives, we are inevitably shaped by the stressors we encounter and the way that we are able to respond to them. Despite being something that is physiologically universal, the way we cope or fail to cope with stress is ultimately individualized. So what exactly is stress? Stress is defined as a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. A shortening of the word distress that passed through the old French word, estresse, I'm not a French speaker, meaning narrowness or oppression and ultimately believed to be partly based on the Latin word strictus or drawn tight. On first glance, this trip through etymology might appear extraneous, but I think that the root of the word here is the key. Stress causes us to feel strained or pulled tight. It can sap our reserves in the same way that you can imagine that a rubber band loses elasticity when pulled tight. Now we can see the full slide. All right, um, stress causes us to feel strained or pulled tight. It can sap our reserves in the same way that you can imagine a rubber band loses elasticity when pulled tight. We cannot be as adaptable or flexible when we're stressed. Given enough strain, that band will snap and so will we. And that concept is something that lends itself aptly to the past two years. In October 2021, the American Psychological Association conducted a poll to evaluate stress levels in US adults. Despite the fact that 70% of those surveyed were confident that everything would work out after the pandemic ends, many of the responses demonstrated the impacts that chronic stress has been having on people, especially younger adults and parents. 74% of US adults have experienced health impacts, including headaches, fatigue, feeling overwhelmed and changes in sleep habits. 59% have experienced behavioral changes as a result of stress, with the results stratified in the lower left by generation and whether or not the respondents were parents. Nearly a quarter of respondents reported avoiding social situations, altering eating habits, procrastinating or neglecting responsibilities, or changes in physical activity. 32% of adults reported that they struggled to make even basic decisions due to stress during the pandemic, with these results again stratified by generation. 
On the right side, we can see the percentage of respondents who rated certain factors as very or somewhat significant. Even though this data is looking specifically at the pandemic, I think it is very telling that in 2019, before any of this began, that at least half of the adults in this country were experiencing significant stress from work, money, family responsibilities, and personal health concerns. The average American adult is experiencing baseline significant stress. And healthcare workers are not immune to these stressors. A 2019 editorial in The Lancet tells the story of a 32-year-old ophthalmologist in China who experienced sudden cardiac death after working for six days straight with uh, six days in a row with a fever. The public response to his death was an outpouring of sympathy and grief with concern drawn to physician burnout, which was a known global issue even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. A 2018 survey of American physicians reported that 78% of them had some degree of burnout, with a 2019 survey in the UK showing that 80% of doctors were at high or very high risk of burnout, with junior doctors at an especially high risk. Our field is one that is characterized by extremes, not just of birth and death, benign and malignant, but by the very nature of the care that we provide. We help patients navigate the challenges of infertility, pregnancy loss, complications of labor, birth and, and the birth of their children. We work to prevent and treat gynecologic cancers, some that carry terrible prognoses for patients and their families, despite our best efforts. Even an annual visit may be a rare time where patients feel comfortable bringing up sensitive concerns about sexual health, incontinence, prolapse, or other topics that impact their quality of life. Bottom line, this is not a stress-free experience for us or our patients. And that is not just conjecture. There is growing evidence of the impact that stress can have on our patients. Stress is a known risk factor for preterm birth and low birth weight infants. The stress can come from outside sources, such as the patient's socioeconomic circumstances and support, environmental factors, such as experiencing a natural disaster, as well as from pregnancy-specific concerns themselves. Patients experiencing subfertility often have associated mental health concerns, with 20% of couples in this situation showing clinically relevant signs of distress. Broadly speaking, patients who experienced gynecologic disorders such as endometriosis, gynecologic cancers, and many of the conditions that we help to manage in our role often experience high levels of stress due to these conditions. OBGYN providers are equally at risk of work-related stress and burnout as other providers, if not more so. A 2019 national survey through the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, including trainees, staff, and specialists, showed that 30% reported high emotional exhaustion and 28% reported higher moderate depersonalization of those in their care. Two thirds of respondents had experienced work-related trauma exposure. And of those reporting these exposure, 31% were affected by symptoms of PTSD. Trainees with clinical level PTSD were more likely to report greater amounts of emotional exhaustion or depersonalization. The 2018 online survey demonstrated that OBGYNs reported among the highest levels of burnout at 46% and burnout with concurrent depression at 20%. A survey of the members of the Society of Gynecologic Oncology found that nearly one third reported emotional exhaustion and 34% reported that their work impacted their quality of life. Both experienced and junior staff positions have been shown in small studies to have higher levels of adrenaline and elevated mental stress levels after a shift on labor and delivery. I could go on. But I think that the point has been made. We as providers and the patients we care for are under a tremendous amount of stress that comes at us from many sources, acute and chronic, global and local. Today, I wanna to talk about the history of research into stress response and coping because stress is not something that will be going away, pandemic or no. How we can adapt, learn and grow as we manage the stressors that we encounter is fundamental to our health and well-being. To take it back a few thousand years, if we were all sitting exactly where we are now, there's a reasonable chance that at least one of us would come into contact with a very real threat of some sort. Were you to turn around and find a saber-toothed tiger behind you, you would experience what has been come to be known as the fight or flight response. This describes what our autonomic nervous system does in the immediate response to a stressor. Our pupils dilate, our heartbeat quickens, glucose is mobilized, and the adrenal glands secrete adrenaline and noradrenaline. Aspects that are not necessary in that immediate response are deprioritized, such as stomach peristalsis. This activation of the ANS is short-lived, but the goal is to mobilize as many resources as possible for us to fight or, flight, fight or fly and survive. To bring things into the modern age, I wanna start in the mid 19th century with a French physiologist by the name of Claude Bernard. Bernard sought to use a lot as a scientific method in medicine and was one of the earliest scientists to conceptualize the idea of a blinded study to ensure that results were valid. 
The most salient of his ideas to our discussion today was that of, and again, I'm not a French speaker, milieu interior or internal environment. This is described as the fixity of the milieu supposes a perfection of the organism such that the external variations are at each instant compensated for and equilibrated. All of the vital mechanisms, however varied they may be, have always one goal, to maintain the uniformity of the conditions of life in the internal environment. The stability of the internal environment is the condition for a free and independent life. Paraphrased, what he is saying is that an internal system undergoes various processes to maintain stability of its environment to ensure survival. This concept evolved into the idea that we now know as homeostasis, but interestingly enough, it was not Dr. Bernard who coined that term. Walter Bradford Cannon was born about 100 miles west of here in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. He graduated from medical school in 1900 and began his research career in physiology. Drawing upon the work of Dr. Bernard, he developed the term homeostasis, which served to describe functions of the body, such as glucose regulation, body temperature, and acid-base balance. He performed a series of investigations that looked at animal responses to pain, cold temperatures, or excessive exercise. He observed that functions that support the body energy reserves at rest were either immediately intensified or entirely interrupted in order to mobilize great energy. This gave rise to the concept of fight or flight. This work led him to propose the existence of the sympathoadrenal system, theorizing that the nervous system and the adrenal gland work together to maintain homeostasis in emergencies, with adrenaline being the neurotransmitter. His idea encapsulates the idea of a neuroendocrine system to respond to outside stimuli. We now know today that norepinephrine, adrenaline's chemical precursor, is in fact the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic nervous system. Activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical, or much more simply, HPA, axis, results in elevation of circulating glucocorticoids, peaking in the tens of minutes after initiation of stress. Cortisol secretion specifically peaks between 20 and 40 minutes after the stressful event. High levels of cortisol have been associated with decreased prefrontal cortex activity and prolonged activation of the amygdala, processes which can lead to reduced ability to regulate emotion, upregulation of response to future stressors, and sustained negative mood. In this vein, cortisol and the activity of the HPA axis have been proposed as having a large role in the onset and continuation of stress-related psychological disorders, such as depression and anxiety. What this tells us is that each time the stress response system is activated, each time the resources are called upon to respond, there are other effects that can leave an impact on the person long-term. Chronic stressors can and will wear us down. This is conceptualized in the work of Hans Selye. He was a Hungarian-Canadian scientist who first observed as a medical student that chronically ill patients suffering from multiple different diseases would often exhibit similar symptoms that we would now commonly call manifestations of stress. While working with laboratory animals, he observed a similar phenomenon in rats exposed to noxious stimuli. From these observations, he developed the concept of a general adaptation syndrome in response to a stressor, later simplifying it to the term stress response. The syndrome is characterized by a set of nonspecific responses which develop in three stages. In his original experiment, which involved exposure of rats to injury, excessive exercise, cold temperature, or sublethal infections of noxious substances, a typical series of events would occur. In phase one, or the alarm phase, this occurred about six to 48 hours later, there was a rapid decrease in the size of the thymus, spleen, lymph glands, and liver. There was disappearance of fat tissue, formation of edema, loss of muscular tone, and formation of acute erosions in the digestive tract, and loss of cortical lipids and chromaffin substances from the adrenals. In the second stage, which occurred starting 48 hours after the injury or exposure, the adrenal glands were greatly enlarged, but did not have any of the other changes from the acute phase. Edema improved, gonads became atrophic, body growth stopped, and the thyroid could become enlarged and milk secretion would stop in lactating animals. Selye theorized that the anterior pituitary ceased production of growth hormone, prolactin, and gonadotropic hormones in favor of increased thyrotropic and adrenotropic needs. He noted that if further small doses of the noxious substance or smaller injuries or exposures occurred, that the animal would build up such resistance that their organ function would remain mostly normal despite exposure to these stimuli. However, if these small scale insults continued for an extended period of time, which in his experiment was about one to three months, the animals would lose their resistance and succumb with physiologic symptoms similar to those seen in the acute phase, described as exhaustion. 
Zellier's concept of prolonged stress producing physical and mental disease has now become widely accepted and studied. Up until this point, the experiments, concepts, and theories that we have discussed have been summoned in nature. The way that I have described them thinks of organisms as generally the same, with the same mechanisms in place to respond to these stressors. And to an extent, this is true. Generally speaking, our physiologic responses function in similar ways, yet were all of us to be presented with the same acute stressor, I would wager to say that not all of us would respond in the same way. And our reaction would be based on many factors, including those intrinsic to us. We have all adapted in response to what we have personally experienced, and that learning has modified our parameters. It has helped us to anticipate and prepare for stressors and challenges. This is the core of the concept of allostasis, which was proposed in 1988 by Dr. Sterling and Iyer. The roots of this word are in the Greek word allos, meaning different, and stasis, meaning standing still. And this tells us the core of its meaning, which is remaining stable by being variable. This is defined as the operating range and the ability of the body to increase or decrease vital functions to a new steady state on challenge. For example, if you are training to run a marathon, the first time that you run 10 miles in a row will be challenging. When it's your 10th or 20th time, it will be easier. Your body will have adapted and can operate more effectively while experiencing the same exact stressor as before. Our operating range can also vary due to other reasons. We have more capacity when we are healthy and well than when we are worn down or sick. As we experience stressors, we learn from them and use that knowledge to predict future stimuli and prepare for them in order to decrease consequences on our body. Building on this, a neuroendocrinologist by the name of Dr. Bruce McEwen authored a paper in 1993 that took this concept further. He argued that allostasis does not take into consideration the effects of repeated stress on the body. This repeated wear and tear, the strain of repeated ups and downs of physiologic response can lead to changes in metabolism, damage to organs, and predisposition to disease. He coined the term allostatic load to refer to these changes. Thinking back to earlier work, you could think of this as a more complex and nuanced way of describing stress response and the general adaptation syndrome that Dr. Sellier developed. On the left here is the proposed schematic that lays out McEwen's concept of allostatic load. We can see that as a stimulus is encountered, benign or concerning, that the first layer is the person's interpretation of that stimulus. Factors such as learning, personal development, and social history assist with interpretation of that input and leads it to be classified as either not a threat or a threat. We can see that threats from an unknown source lead to stress and vigilance, whereas those from a known source lead to various responses that have a differing cost to them. Subsequent behavior and emotion in response to this assessment then leads to biological responses, which are also impacted by everything seen in the box on the center right. At the bottom, we see a proposed model of how utilizations of these systems, the mediators of stress response, can lead to disease outcomes. To pause for a moment and review, what we have learned so far is that all humans experience stressors throughout our lives. These can be physical, such as injury, physiological, such as illness, or emotional. Our bodies react to these stressors through interactions between our neurological system that recognizes or perceives the stressors and our endocrine system that helps our body to respond with the goal of maintaining stability while adapting, maintaining homeostasis or achieving allostasis. However, extreme, chronic, or repeated stressors can eventually overwhelm our system's ability to manage them, leading to burnout, disease, and collapse. The diagram on the left shows these differences between levels of stress and the importance of support in being able to combat them. How we as humans are able to buffer these stressors and try to protect ourselves from the effects of toxic stress. This is our ability to cope. And what exactly is coping? To cope refers to the act of a person dealing effectively with something difficult. You'll have to forgive my root through etymology again, but I think again that the root of the word expands upon its meaning. This word passed through the Middle English and Old French, originally from the Latin cope or culp, referring to a blow. And this all originates from the Greek word kolophos, meaning a blow with the fist. You may have think a lot of coping as a passive process, as a matter of endurance or distraction. I would argue instead that effective coping is an active process. Stressors will knock each of us down, and it's a matter of learning how to punch back. Coping as a concept was developed out of its relationship to the stressor. Some of our earlier models of stress and its impact fall in these first top two patterns. In the idea of stress as the response, it is seen as the dependent, predictable variable that follows a noxious stimulus, as was seen in the experiments of Sellier or Cannon. 
In the idea of stress as a stimulus, other scientists theorize that stress was an independent variable, the cause of the unpleasant experience and its effects. The bottom row encapsulates the work of an American psych um, psychologist, Richard Lazarus, who put these ideas together to try to ex better explain stress as part of a dynamic process. And in doing so developed the transactional theory of stress and coping. Lazarus proposed that stress is a product of the transaction between a person, including multiple systems, cognitive, physiological, affective, psychological, and neurological, and his or her complex environment. From this, we build on the prior model described by McEwen's paper on allostatic load. How an individual appraises a stressor determines how he or she copes with or responds to that stressor. Whether or not the stressor is experienced as troubling or discomforting is influenced by a variety of factors, including that individual's capacity, skill, constraints, resources, and social norms. We see here on the right that this schematic shows a flow of response to that stimulus. The primary appraisal is the interpretation of that stressor, determining if it is something positive, like a challenging puzzle, or something dangerous. The secondary appraisal is our determination of how well we can manage that danger. As an example, if we have a big project due and do not feel like we have enough time or ability to complete it, that will cause stress. And our response to that stress, rooted in our perception of it, can be thought of as having levels. The most basic level is what we've already talked about earlier in this discussion. The underlying physiologic responses that are out of our control, our bodies attempt to maintain homeostasis. Next is the subconscious response, which contains the most described defense, me defense mechanisms, behaviors and actions that we take when confronted with stress. And finally, we have the conscious strategies where we either attempt to adapt internally, such as focusing on relaxation prior to an anticipated stressor, or seek out support from our environment or our peers. Dr. George Valent, a Harvard psychiatrist, organized defense mechanisms into a four-level classification system, which was drawn from observations on longitudinal research on middle-aged men who were followed prospectively for 40 years. Level one are pathological defenses, essentially allowing the person to rearrange external experiences to eliminate the need to cope with reality. These methods are seen in early childhood and often appear irrational or insane. They are commonly seen in psychosis. Examples of these can include denial and distortion. Level two are immature defenses and can be seen in teenagers and adults. They reduce distress and anxiety by producing an by, 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 produced by an uncomfortable or threatening reality. Those individuals who use these defenses frequently can be challenging to deal with and can appear to be out of touch with reality. These mechanisms can be seen in major depression and personality disorders, with examples including acting out, projection, and passive aggressive behavior. Level three are neurotic defenses and are fairly common in adults. These can have short-term advantages in coping, um, but they run the risk of causing long-term problems in relationships, work, and life enjoyment when used often. Examples of this can include displacement, dissociation, intellectualization, and repression. And finally, level four are mature defenses, and these are seen in emotionally healthy adults. These often have origins in immature mechanisms, but unlike earlier discussed examples, are conscious processes that have been adopted, drawing on the experience to optimize success in relationships and society. The use of these enhances happiness and feelings of control. Examples of this can include humor, altruism, and anticipation. These mature defense mechanisms can be differentiated from their less advanced counterparts because of the cognitive effort that goes into employing them. One difficulty in tackling this topic is that there is not a well-defined nomenclature or categorization of coping mechanisms, which invites criticisms into research, message on the top, research methods on the topic. While frustrating, this does, in a sense, make sense. Just as our stress responses are inherently individualized, our coping mechanisms are also tailored to our unique needs. While reviewing all different published clusters of terms could be an entire lecture and discussion itself, generally speaking, most sources discuss coping in the context of different focuses. The originally proposed pair by Lazarus were problem-focused and emotion-focused. To go back to the example we used before, if we have a big project due and do not feel like we have enough time or ability to complete it, we will experience stress. Our coping mechanisms allow us to take that confusion, uh, sorry, take that conclusion from the secondary appraisal and work through it. Maybe the project seems enormous and daunting because we haven't tried to break it into smaller and more manageable parts. Maybe we could reevaluate our schedule and obligations to try to free up more time to accomplish what we need to. This is in contrast to emotion-based coping, which could be positive, such as seeking out emotional support from peers or family, or negative, such as avoiding the issue by distracting yourself with unnecessary tasks, or in 
uh, self-defeating way using alcohol or drugs. Not all coping mechanisms fit nicely into those two groups, however. Further studies in the late 20th century added the concept of meaning-focused coping, where someone draws on values, beliefs, and goals to modify the meaning of a stressor. This approach can be useful in more chronic stressors that cannot always be dealt with in a problem-focused fashion. This was reported to be the most frequent coping mechanism used in a study on caregivers of patients with dementia. Other studies describe social coping, either as a part of the above mentioned mechanisms or an idea in of itself, where someone uses social support, resources, and community to overcome stress adversity. Measurement, classification, and understanding of these mechanisms and approaches is as much an art as it is a science. While these prior studies and efforts to understand how we manage stress are important, they are at best an approximation of an infinitely complex reality. As we've been discussing some of the research and more general concepts of stress and coping today, my hope is that you have noticed some common themes. Our perception of stress, along with our belief in our ability to handle it, is critical in our ability to respond to it. When we cannot or are unable to handle stress effectively, this can impact our mental health and potentially even our physical health when exposed to chronic toxic stress. As we grow and develop, immature mechanisms that were used when we were younger or less experienced are replaced with more mature ones. Strategies that help us to feel an increased sense of control, help us to remain resilient, regulate our emotions, and feel satisfied with our situation. So having considered all of this, where do we go from there? One psychological treatment that has been shown to be effective for numerous mental health problems and substance use disorders is cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. This treatment is built on the concepts that what we think, what we feel, and how we behave are all interrelated. There is not one exact definition of CBT, but it is a form of psychotherapy that aims to help individuals challenge their patterns of thinking in order to replace errors called cognitive distortions with the goal of decreasing emotional distress and maladaptive behaviors. CBT is based on a set of core principles. Psychological problems, or in the context of our discussion today, psychological distress, is based in part on faulty or unhelpful ways of thinking. This is akin to someone having a poor appraisal of their ability to handle a stressor. Psychological problems are also based in part on learned patterns of unhelpful behaviors. And this could be equated to poor coping or immature defense mechanisms. And finally, that people suffering from psychological problems or distress can learn better ways of coping with them relieving that distress and becoming more functional. So how does CBT actually work? By helping us to understand and modify our thinking and behavior. This could include addressing our thinking by recognizing distortions, using problem solving, and developing confidence as we gain a greater understanding of ourselves and how, in a sense, to outsmart our own negative thought patterns. This extends into behavioral patterns, such as working through confronting our fears, preparing for interactions that could cause us stress, and learning ways that we can remain calm and relax the body. In a sense, the goal is to help individuals to become their own therapists. The principles of CBT may be used clinically to address those with mental health concerns, but I think that the deeper meaning here is much more widely applicable and can be used by any of us. The common themes of these interventions ringing similar to our discussion on effective coping, increasing understanding and improving a sense of control over our circumstances but the world of medicine is not that simple. Many of us have heard the phrase, we do not have a crystal ball, or probably even said it ourselves on labor and delivery in the clinic or elsewhere. In medicine, this is a humbling truth that the future cannot be completely predicted. Coping with this uncertainty is something that we as healthcare providers become very well versed in over the course of our training. Our experience and understanding of research, science, physiology, and data allows us to approximate the likely course of things but we cannot know for certain. For our patients, being thrown into a system that is often unfamiliar can lead to them feeling overwhelmed by diagnoses, treatment options, setbacks, complications, and the fact that the future cannot be known. Someone with a placenta previa has to go about their daily lives knowing that there is a chance they could have a catastrophic bleed that could threaten their life at any time. Someone with a new cancer diagnosis after not seeing a healthcare provider for years may have trouble processing information or making decisions because they still haven't fully come to terms with their condition. Every day, each of us interacts with patients who are trying to cope with stressors as well as they can, including stressors that we may not even perceive. In our patient's perception, their appraisal of the situation has become more clinically relevant. 
Perceived stress has been shown to be more predictive of some poor obstetric outcomes than objective measures alone. Chronic stress and perception of stress may impact oncologic outcomes, as well as impact those patients seeking assistive reproductive technology. The perceived stress levels in patients with overactive bladder have been correlated with worse symptoms of incontinence. And these are just a few of the examples that exist so far in the literature. And I don't wanna propose that objective measures of, measures of stress, anxiety, and depression are unhelpful. Seen here are the GAD7 um, PHQ-9, which is blocked partially by that, and the perceived stress scale. These are validated screening tools and should be used as part of our practice, but we should not hang our hats on the numerical values reported by these tools alone. Patients may not feel comfortable being completely honest on these forms, especially if they are walking into an unfamiliar clinical environment. While these can help us identify patients who are at risk of elevated perceived stress, there is a component to this that ultimately comes down to the most human part of medicine, our interactions as patients and providers. So what can we do for our patients? We need to listen and empathize with them. The same condition can be perceived dramatically differently by two different patients. And to navigate that course with each of them is a part of our job that cannot be overlooked. We should utilize supportive language and seek to understand the patient's perspective and perception of their situation, or in other words, their appraisal of the stressor. We should connect them with therapy, psychiatry, and support services as needed to manage concurrent mental health concerns that we may not be able to address on our own. And finally, we need to do a better job of engaging in discussions about stress and how our patients manage it. An estimated 60 to 80% of primary care visits by patients may have a stress-related component. But one survey showed that only 3% of providers engaged in stress management counseling with patients. Stress was less commonly counseled on than nutrition, physical activity, weight reduction, or smoking cessation. These same approaches of empathy, support, and understanding that we apply to our patients, we also need to apply to ourselves. Healthcare providers are known to run ourselves into the ground in an effort to do more for others in less time with less resources. But we will become burnt out and stay that way if we don't treat ourselves with kindness. We should aim to manage our sources of stress when we can. I do want to note that our ability to do this feels limited in the system that we work in, especially as trainees due to how much we cannot control. But what we can and should do is advocate for a change in systems that are not working, propose ideas for improvement, and optimize the things that can be controlled. These are tangible steps in the right direction. The final point here about monitoring our attitude and thoughts is not asking us to lie to ourselves and pretend that everything is okay, but to instead consider our responses to the stressors that we experience, to reach out to support from our, for, for support from our peers, families, and mentors, and allow negative emotions their space and time, but to work to process them so that they don't consume us. We can celebrate the fact that we do make a difference in the care that we provide, and that even short conversations with our patients can have a tremendous impact. But what is the solution? I wish that I could stand here and tell you that it all comes down to yoga or mindfulness, a healthy diet, exercise, a 30 hour work week, or any one silver bullet. But by now I'm sure that you've realized the trend here. It is ultimately an individualized process. It truly comes down to that secondary appraisal. Many of the people sitting here in this room today would consider public speaking something that causes a great deal of stress. We're already way past that primary appraisal. The danger is real. But our perception of our ability to handle it, the resources and support that we are able to draw upon, our own resilience, and too many other factors to name here, this is what allows us to cope. To take a look at that stressor, square up, and punch back. Stress permeates all of our lives, professionally and personally. Awareness of our responses to stressors, both those we can control and those we can't, helps us to better understand and support our patients as well as our peers. We are not therapists by trade, but by leaning into these discussions, we can strengthen our relationships and improve communication. We ultimately are just people taking care of other people, and it's simultaneously as simple and as complicated as that. I have many people to acknowledge. Um, I need to thank my husband, Matt, for always inspiring me, uh, my parents for all their love and support throughout this long journey of mine, my classmates for being incredible friends and for setting the bar so very high with each of your Grand Rounds presentations earlier this year, um, to Dr. Zweifel for, your, Zweifel for your guidance and mentorship as I prepared this talk, and I need to thank the entire UW-Madison community for all of your support over these past four years. These are my references. It's all for your attention.
there a way to bring the tab of people's faces back? <laughs> Wonderful job, John. Um, we'll uh, open it up to any questions, either in person or online. Can I go, Laura? This is Bagman. Of course. I don't know why I'm getting an echo. Okay, I apologize. Uh, John, wonderful presentation, really timely. And uh, uh, the depth with which you approach the subject is, uh, was really uh, very good. Thank you so much. I just have a comment. We talk a lot about mindfulness now. There was a very good study that came out of UK recently that showed that mindfulness is not the fantasy, as you said, it's not, a, there's no silver bullet. And mindfulness can actually backfire and make a person more selfish and think only about themselves. Again, not saying that all mindfulness is bad, but um, that it can have negative consequences as well. There's a well-designed study and uh, uh, we have to keep thinking about these as not the panacea, but as individualized prescriptions that we have to work and uh, figure out what fits best. Thank you, yes. That's... Um, I would like to make a comment. This is Jordan Ward for those who can't see me talking. Um, thank you, John, for such um, an insightful and impressive presentation. Um, throughout your presentation, I kept thinking about um, last summer, there was a study that was published in JAMA Surgery that showed that female surgeons have a higher rate of pregnancy loss and twice as much as the general population and a higher risk of pregnancy complications. And I just kept thinking about that during, you know, when we're thinking about how does stress affect our patients um, and we're thinking about our obstetric patients, then how does stress affect us? And that just feels like it's this intersection of both of them. And they don't really talk about, you know, I mean, obviously it's kind of implied, right? Like, is this, is there some level of physical stress or mental stress or emotional stress? Probably some combination of all of it. Um, but I just think that's something, it's just a comment. And then, yeah, I don't know if you have any comments that you wanna say about it, but I just kept thinking about that during your presentation. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And I think that really you kind of encapsulated it where it isn't just one thing. It's not an 80 hour work week. It's not a seven hour surgery versus a four hour surgery. It's everything about that. What that individual who have, who's a surgeon who might also be pregnant is dealing with at home, with life, with work, with everything. And like we kind of even went to that, that earlier slide of that study, looking at the pandemic and how it affected stress, baseline, money, family, all of those things. I think and you know, this kind of gets into also how we think about our patients is that you know, we have no idea what anybody else is going through. And it's some kind of almost simplistic and cliche to say that like treat everyone with kindness because of that. But I think we can take it to that next level as providers and kind of open up the discussion about that in a way that can be effective by showing that we do truly care about those things and we can try to help our patients optimize whatever they can, knowing that we can't fix everything. And I think even admitting that as people who are perfectionists and high achievers and are so used to having the answer for everything, admitting that we lack the answer, I think in a way is a great way to build rapport with patients because it kind of sets those expectations and evens the playing field. But thank you very much for bringing that up. Hey, John, I don't know if you can hear me. This is Julie, I'm talking. Yes, hi. Okay, so I, I first of all, super loved the presentation and I loved the, or the discussion of terms um, I learned I learned some things today and it was super cool. But I want to go back to you were mentioning that in primary care visits, people are talking about stress. And you were also, um, and I'm completely in agreement with you, um, not really advocating over-reliance on measures. I think they have value. But one of the things that I feel is, is helpful is to recognize that we really kind of have our own barometer of other people's stress. Stress is, stress is, it's contagious, it's catchy. And so if you just walk into a room and you pay attention to the person who you, who's in that room, you're going to get a sense in your gut of how stressed that person is. So that's, that's one way to actually to perceive it. 
But the other thing is sort of, you can use that as a tool then. And I don't just mean, I, I mean this for all providers, is that because emotions are catchy, providers can set an emotional tone too, and it will impact the uh, recipient of that. So if we are working to center ourselves before we go in and we interact with patients, particularly if we anticipate that they may be struggling, that's actually going to affect things. They're, they're going to pick that up at sort of a deep brain level, and it's going to bring them down a notch, maybe not very many notches, but so this whole thing about being aware of things, we can use that as a tool to actually influence our patients. So I just wanted to share that. But again, super great presentation. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And I think as a lesson for all the residents, you know, many, I'm sure all of us have been in some environment where, you know, you go into triage, nurse comes out of the room and she is just like, oh my gosh, this patient is just like freaking out or they're crying or it's this whole thing. And I think we build up something to be a lot more than it actually is. So especially if a patient is upset, you kind of gear yourself up for that. I literally was in clinic the other day and gearing myself for a really challenging phone call. And it ended up going fine because like Dr. Zweifel mentioned, like, you know, if you're able to kind of take that breath and say, yep, they might yell at me and they might be really upset, but if I match that, I'm just going to make it worse and try to kind of equalize it. Oftentimes you can get a better response. Not always, like she said, it's imperfect. Um, but I think that that cognizance of, our, of kind of where our own biorhythm is at walking into those situations is also super important. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, and I would just piggyback on that. I would call it being emotional ballast. Sometimes that's what I really feel I'm doing is being emotional ballast for patients. So it's just a concept. So John, I, uh, I just want to congratulate you on your grand rounds. This is a really um, super important topic, but it's also not an easy one to put yourself up there and, um, and speak to this kind of an audience. And we're lucky to have Jillian's wife in the department who um, actually has expertise and can give us advice, but I just want to congratulate you on the, on the grand rounds. Um, this uh, business of handling our own stress and coping and wellness and burnout and compassion fatigue, this uh, topic was all over our annual meeting at the SGO this year. Uh, and I actually did a session on improving your own communication skills, which can then in turn assist with your own personal burnout and compassion fatigue. And I just think um, uh, the, the topic area is really timely. And, uh, and I just want to, again, say, you know, thanks for putting yourself out there and, and, and really trying to, you know, give it some justice. Uh, we do have some really great expertise in the department with Julianne Zweifel and a lot of efforts with our, our wellness committee. And uh, I don't know if anybody on the wellness team is on the call, but, you know, any anytime we have an opportunity to plug those uh, activities, I think um, if we have time, it'd be uh, it'd be good to do so. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartenbach. So John, that was an excellent talk. Uh, how do you think the stress works uh, in terms of our patients? Because our patients are dealing with a lot more categories of stress uh, than more of us privileged people deal with. So in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of culture, uh, we know that uh, from a paper produced by Dr. Z uh, Dulo, that really there's no biological genetic basis and, uh, for race, and that's from the Human Genome Project also. So how is it, how, how are patients impacted, particularly African-American patients, uh, in that uh, they have the highest rates of preterm birth? What do you why do you think they have the highest rates of preterm birth? I think one topic that you bring up, and I unfortunately wasn't able to go into this more broadly in this discussion about chronic toxic stress, but I think especially in this country, we see, like you said, differing birth outcomes for African-American patients versus their white counterparts. And I think it does, in a sense, come down to not just socioeconomic, those things like that, but also overt racism in the medical system and kind of at all levels of our society, things that, you know, as a society, we need to kind of do our best to process, work through, and reverse. Um, but I think that there is the cumulative effect of generational trauma, 
long-term impacts on housing availability, educational availability, access to those things, financial stability that have stacked the deck in a way that we haven't seemed to be willing as a society to completely address yet. And I'm hopeful that it's something that we can continue to do. But I think on the micro, that's on the macro scale. I think on the micro scale, it's also something that we need to be very cognizant of in every interaction that we have. Um, you know, we've even had discussions um, throughout our conversations on Thursday U throughout this year about differences in what our patients experience, those who are white and those who are black, even on our own units um, on labor and delivery or on postpartum in terms of pain control and other things like that. And so I think while it can feel like we can't truly do anything globally about this, I think focally we can work very hard as residents to provide equal care to everybody and all or equitable care to everybody, I should say, and to be very cognizant of those factors and to be honest, you know, be know, know that certain patients may be um, portrayed as angry or portrayed as um, upset or distrusting or anything like that. So almost setting our almost setting us up for the opposite of what Dr. Ju Dr. Swiffel was saying, where it tries to we get ramped up about it because our perception of it's going to be worse than it actually is. Um, but I think it's very important for us to remember that those biases exist, even in how communication happens from provider to provider. Um, that's just kind of a, a foray into that. I'm sure there's a lot more that I could discuss there, but that's my, my best answer for the moment. I'll stand in response. Thank you. John, this is India. For anyone who can't see me, um, I have nothing to add. I would just like to say that I think your response to that last question was amazing. And I think that all of the kind of barriers that you listed certainly contribute to chronic toxic stress for our underrepresented patients. And I just wanna say that I feel very thankful and honored to be a coworker of yours and be able to train with you based off of that very thoughtful answer that you gave. So thank you. Hey, John, hey, it's Matt. Uh, oh, sorry. Go no, you go, Doctor Lowell. It's all right. I just have one real quick comment. I, you know, I think I, John, great, great presentation. I think one thing we can do as providers is sometimes just acknowledge that stress with our patients. You know, you you can tell people are going through a lot, or they got a you know they're pregnant, they're dealing with a you know high risk pregnancy, and they got you know three other kids at home, or you know, or just they have a lot going on in their life. And I think sometimes it's just nice for the patient to to hear someone say, "Hey, you've got a lot going on." I know this is stressful, you know, I can empathize with what you're dealing with. And I think sometimes that just, that helps a patient kind of like be like, okay, it's okay that I'm feeling this stressed out or they're going through a miscarriage. And, you know, you acknowledge that the stress that that's having on the patient. And I notice when I see patients and I, I just, you know, say it out loud that, Hey, this is stressful. This is, you know, hard to go through. I can always tell like the, the attitude in the room can, always goes down a little bit and it's just um or not the attitude i guess i want to say the it's almost like you let you just like let out you know you opened up the, the 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 shaken can and all that like emotion was able just to come out there so i, I would encourage people to acknowledge their patients when they're feeling stressed out and say hey i i understand you're stressed and it's okay it's my only comment yeah i think that validation is actually very critical in kind of helping us to get on the same page with our patients and kind of destigmatize a sort of like I'm the provider with all this knowledge and you are the patient who is like receiving this knowledge which was like the old school way of medicine you know where it was or more a little more authoritative and that's not a blanket statement just kind of general the trend that was more that way potentially but I think you're right acknowledging that destigmatizing it because patients are probably upset that they are upset. I mean, none of us want to be emotional in front of other people unnecessarily in society. It feels so vulnerable, but those office visits are sometimes times where if we open that door, like you mentioned, it can be tremendously valuable for our patients. So thank you for bringing that up. Hey, it's Matt again. Hey. Um, so you alluded to the sort of competing interests in these various visits between someone that is coming in seeking medical care, brings stress to the table, brings some other type of concern. And there's certainly interventions for that that have been studied like prospectively in a randomized setting. And then they track metrics like healthcare utilization or like pain scores or things like that. But I'm just curious in terms of thinking about it from a system standpoint and actually getting like clinics and different healthcare systems to implement and care. Usually you need some type of like cost effectiveness, like analysis or some like 
put your money where your mouth is situation. And did you come across any information in that setting? And then on top of that, do you think that some of those metrics like healthcare utilization or like using some of these standardized questionnaires are actually good sort of data-driven outcomes for some of that prospective research? Or is that stuff that we're just using to make ourselves feel better? Good question. Um, I didn't dig so much into like how we could necessarily like look at specific data on, you know, whether a 20 minute visit or a 15 minute visit or a 30 versus a 15 is necessarily better. I do think that's a huge factor in this is that we are told to see more patients in less time. And then of course that brings stress to us because suddenly we're an hour behind in clinic and the rest of our patients are upset. But this 15 minute OB visit turned into something that needed a lot more attention and discussion. And while of course we can then try to schedule that person for a longer visit in the future, we're discouraged from doing that um, in some senses from, because to fit more people in. So I think, you know, if I had all the money and time in the world, I, I would love to be able to do some evaluation of kind of that patient experience and even not beyond patient, but like kind of clinic experience and say like, let's say we switched all of our OB patients who are deemed high risk in our clinic to 30 minute visits instead of 15 minute visits, which is actually what MFM has for their patients is they have 30 minute visits for theirs. If our patients are of that caliber of complex complexity and we give them that 30 minutes, is it less stressful for the patient? Is it less stressful for the provider? Is it better for the MAs? I mean, I do think that we could do some sort of QI initiative there and whether or not I could convince UW's block schedules and health link to let us do that, that remains to be seen. But I think it is that kind of micro, the step in the right direction, that micro scale thing being like in this clinic, I'm seeing that, you know, my chronic pelvic pain patients, they're only getting settled for half an hour and that's just not enough. So where can I find evidence like Dr. Ladani uses hour long visits for her patients with that same issue? Maybe I can't justify doing an hour, but maybe I could justify 45 minutes. And how could I prove that? So that's a really great idea. I wish I had more smart things to say right now, but I hope to look more into that in the future if I can. So thank you for bringing that up. Wonderful job here, John. Um, I think we're about at time now, so um, we'll call it here, but uh, really great. Um, you know, praise in the chat here. I hope you get to take a quick look at that, but um, really excellent presentation. Thank you everyone for joining in and for some great uh, conversation and questions here. Uh, have a great day, everyone. <laughs>